Hello. Psalm 6 verse 6. I'm worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. I'm sure that's the refrain of so many South Africans, many in the world, but particularly South Africans and many of you who are listening to me right now. So many of us have lost so much. Loved ones, friends, colleagues, businesses, jobs. There's a huge sense of loss in people's lives. They're gaping holes and people don't know how to deal with it. And so people find themselves weeping, weeping because of the loss and trying to ask God if he doesn't understand. And many people say, where's God in all of this? How do we understand God? Where is God in my sorrow? Well, if we want to understand what God is like, we need to understand what Jesus is like, because Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the exact representation of the Godhead. That's what the incarnation is all about, God becoming a man. And so when we want to know what God's like, we have a look and see what Jesus is like. And in John chapter 11, verse 35, there's a wonderful verse there, just two words. It says, Jesus wept. That tells us that God is able to weep. Why was Jesus weeping? Jesus was weeping because his friend Lazarus had died. He had suffered some loss. But not only was he weeping because he had suffered loss, he was weeping because the two sisters of Lazarus, namely Mary and Martha, were in grief. So he felt their grief. Our God is a God of compassion who is able to empathize with us. He gives us a place to stand and he tells us that he's able to weep with us. But we can take it even further than that and we can go to the crucifixion. And we read this in Mark chapter 15, verse 34. At three o'clock, Jesus groaned out of the depths, crying loudly, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And there we see Jesus on the cross, crying from the depths of his being, God, why have you abandoned me? God understands pain. One thing we learn from the cross is that God understands pain. Your pain, my pain. He understands abandonment, being forsaken. So God understands what we're going through as you go to bed at night, as you sit on your couch during the day, as you get more bad news and your weeping begins again. You need to know that God understands what it is you're going through. But you see, that was Friday when Jesus was dying on the cross. And as many a preacher said, that was Friday, but Sunday's coming. And we turn to Easter Sunday morning and we read the account in Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 to 6. The angel spoke to the woman, there is nothing to fear here. I know you're looking for Jesus, the one they nailed to the cross. He is not here. He was raised just as he said, come and look at the place where he was placed. So while God says, I understand what you're going through, God also wants you and me to know that our pain, our loss, our suffering, even death does not have the last word. Death didn't have the last word. Abandonment didn't have the last word. Pain didn't have the last word because God raised Jesus from the dead. So resurrection life is the final word in all of this. And here's what's important. You see, when Jesus was with Lazarus and his two sisters and they were agonizing and feeling their pain, we read in John eleven twenty five, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. You see, you and I need to understand and it's not to soften things, it's not to gloss over anything, it's not to minimize pain and heartache, but the answer really is this, this life isn't the end. You see, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And death didn't have the last word in his life, and those who believe in him, even though we die, yet will we live. 
That is the promise we have from God. That's what our faith's all about. Not, you need faith for a miracle. You need faith for this. No, you need faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died and rose again and that he's coming back for his church, for you and me. That's what we need faith for. We need faith to believe that. And when we do believe that, you know, a wonderful thing, a wonderful verse comes to mind. Psalm 112, verse 7. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Let me share with you where I got this verse from. It was many years ago, I was at a conference at a place called Kyara. And the speaker happened to be a man called David Sherman. Now, I don't remember the conference. I don't remember the sermons. I don't remember his sermon. I remember nothing. I only remember him quoting this verse. They will not be afraid of bad news. And bang, it hit me. I thought of it. And I thought of how often I am afraid of bad news. How often I would be so scared to hear bad news and what am I going to hear about this or what am I going to hear about that? And I used to travel a lot in those days visiting churches, planting churches. And we were living in this particular home at that time. And I would come home late at night, 11, half past 11, maybe midnight. And I'd pull up outside my garage. And as I got out the car to open the door, I had this thought, I hope I don't find one of my sons hanging from the rafters. It was a thing I was scared of, I was afraid of. I was, I was like, I don't want to hear bad news. Don't tell me anything's happened to any of my children. And that started me on a journey. And I want to encourage you to go on this journey. It started me on a journey of dealing with how I would respond to bad news. It doesn't say you won't get bad news. It says you will not have any fear of bad news. And I had to deal with how I would respond. And I dealt with how it would be if my parents died, Patricia died, my children died. I dealt with all of that. I thought, you know what? I'll be okay with that. And when my parents died, I was absolutely fine. Now, I can't say I'll be absolutely fine in all the other instances, but the one area where I really do struggle is um, I haven't worked through my grandchildren yet. <laughs> so that can be pretty normal. But I want to just leave that with you. And I want you to take two verses Psalm 6 verse 6 and Psalm 112 verse 7, those two psalms, and I want you to just park them on the side for a while as I go to the text that I want to share with you today in the sermon which I've entitled Gratitude. And it's Luke chapter 17 verses 1 to 11, and we're going to read that together. It says this, It happened that as he made his way toward Jerusalem, he crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men, all leopards, met him. They kept their distance, but raised their voices, calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Taking a good look at them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. They went, and while still on their way, became clean. One of them, when he realized that he was healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet so grateful he couldn't thank him enough. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus said, were not ten healed? Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider. Then he said to him, get up on your way. Your faith has healed and saved you. <laughs> what an incredible story now. I suppose many of us, if we've been in church long enough, are quite familiar with the story. Maybe you've never heard the story before and it's the first time you're hearing about it. But the thing that obviously strikes one immediately when you read this story is the lack of gratitude. The thing that strikes one immediately is that only one person responded out of 10. That is such a low percentage, 10%, 10% of the people that benefited from the kindness of Jesus responded. Now, I'm not pointing a finger at anyone. I'm guilty of a lack of response myself very often. And um, we're very quick to react, but very slow to respond. 
And uh, even when it comes to sermons and messages, and even this one, you know, we hear sermons Sunday after Sunday. You know, you, you may not know this, but pastors, ministers, to use an expression, bust the gut. Week of the week to churn out another message, another sermon. It takes a huge amount of effort. And some of us can't even remember what was preached an hour ago. In fact, some preachers can't even remember what they preached a week ago. It's so bad it is so often. We just information overload and we get so much information. But I want to ask you to do something today. Because I believe that response is so important. It's so important to respond. And I'm going to ask you that if you remember nothing else, if you will remember just this one thing. Will you remember today, as you switch this TV off or switch your phone off, would you remember this word, respond? And ask yourself, how will I respond to God, to Jesus, to the Word, to people, to my loved ones? How will I respond in future? Just this one thing that you could maybe remember. Now, let's go back to the story. First of all, we take this leper, an ordinary leper, one of the lepers, a man, an ordinary person, a person with an ordinary job. Maybe he wakes up one morning and he sees a saw on his hand, or maybe he's out in the field working and he notices a discoloration of the skin on his thigh, or maybe he notices that his uh, scalp begins to flake, and uh, he, he looks at it and he wonders to himself, well, I wonder what that is, and oh, well, maybe it's nothing. And then he sees that it gets bigger. And you know what it's like? Well, maybe it'll go away. Dreading the worst, worst, hoping for the best. And eventually he begins to see that something is wrong. You know, they were au fait with this sickness, this disease called leprosy. They'd seen it amongst the community, amongst their own loved ones, how people would get this skin disease. Well, actually it wasn't a skin disease, it was a nerve disease. And... Uh, how blood didn't get to the nerve ends and how the septicemia would set in and how people's fingers would eventually just drop off their hands. And it was a, it was a horrible disease. And, you know, when someone saw and noticed a mark, a hair turning color, and you can go and read all about it in Leviticus chapter 13, because Leviticus chapter 13 explains everything to us about how the leper had to deal with this problem. And I can imagine him looking at this thing and thinking, you know what, according to Leviticus chapter 13, I have a responsibility, not only to myself, but to my community. You see, if I have a disease that I think is contagious, if I have a disease that I think I can spread to other people, it is my responsibility to make sure that I don't. And so can you imagine him going off to the priest and the priest examines him? You know, the priest gives him an MRI scan looks at this thing and he waits for the judgment. His heart is pounding, his, his heart is in his boots. And the priest says, leprosy, my word. I will not be afraid of bad news. Right there and then, he is told that he's got leprosy. And right now, he's received bad news. And right now, he can't go back to his family. He cannot go back home. He is now excluded. He must leave everyone he loves. He must leave everyone he knows. He has to go and live amongst other people like himself. He's not allowed to shave. He's got to, his hair has got to look weird. He's got to look like a weirdo. His clothing's got to be torn. He's got to, be, he's got to stand out. He's got to stand out so people can know, careful, there's something wrong with that person. And this leper knew that now he had to go and make himself look horrible, look terrible, stand out. And in fact, he was even given a bell and he would ring the bell when people came near and he would shout the words, unclean, unclean. He knew what it was like to be isolated, to be removed from his family. What a horrible situation. And I suppose many of you can relate to this right now in a different way. So off he goes, this leper. And I suppose Psalm 6 verse 6 now is his portion. I'm worn out from my groaning all night long. I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. That leper, that's his life living amongst other lepers. 
and they just end up dying limb after limb, falling off, disappearing in isolation away from their families. What an absolutely horrible thing. But there's the ten of them, and there they are near a village, and Jesus is about to enter the village. Enter Jesus. <laughs> Wow! And there they see, it's him. In fact, they knew he was coming, if you read the story carefully. They knew he was coming. They were waiting for him. And Jesus enters into the situation. You know, when Jesus enters in, things are going to change. And what's important is how they respond to Jesus. And I want you to notice what happens here. Jesus looks at them carefully, it says. And at a distance, he says to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. What? You might say, what does that mean? Well, Leviticus 40, what that meant was, go and show yourself to the priest, and if the, the priest's going to examine you, and you're going to be declared clean. They decided to go. And so what we see now in the story is the power of response. And I want you to notice that there are two responses in the story. Now the first response is the response of all ten of them. Jesus says to them, go show yourselves to the priest. They go. They didn't see any change. They did not see any change whatsoever. But it says, as they went on their way, so they became clean. In other words, their first response was to believe. It's faith. They believed Jesus. They believed that he was going to be healed, that they were going to be healed, that, that the word that Jesus had spoken to them was a word of healing. And so they went on their way, and on their way, their faith was rewarded, and they were cleansed. So for you and me, we need to learn how to respond. When Jesus speaks, we need to learn how to respond to the word. I'm not an expert at this. I mean, right now, I would love to hear a healing word from Jesus in my condition. And daily I'm open to it. I'm open to it in his word. I'm open to it in the messages that people send me. I'm open to it in every message that I listen to. I'm just open to it all the time. And we need to learn how to respond in a believing way to Jesus because when they responded with, by believing, something happened to them. And on the way, to the priest, all, ten of them were cleansed. And that brings us to the second response. Now, the second response, the first response was all ten, but the second response is only one. One of ten. And this man, when he realized that he was cleansed, when he realized that, oh my goodness me, I have been cleansed, I have been healed, he didn't continue to the priest. It says that he turned around and he went back to Jesus and his response was thanksgiving. And so we move from not just believing, but from believing to thanksgiving. And I want you to notice what happens. It says that he, that he went praising God with thanksgiving and he, he kneeled down at Jesus' feet and with great gratitude, he, he shouted, uh, praise God and glory to God in the highest. His, his response went from thanksgiving to gratitude. He didn't stay at thanksgiving. It went from thanksgiving to gratitude. And gratitude is a step along the way from thanksgiving. You see, there's a progression here. We start off with thanksgiving and we end up with Gratitude. There's an incredible response that takes place in the story over here. You see, thanksgiving is a feeling, whereas gratitude is an action. And we need to learn. I need to learn. And I will share with you part of my story on how I've learned through thanksgiving. How I've learned to understand gratitude. But I believe it went even further than that. I believe it went from thanksgiving to gratitude to joy. Come on. Can you imagine this guy's joy? He must have jumped for joy. He must have been ecstatic. He must have been 
over the moon. How glorious and how glorious a story and how much we can learn from it. So what we learn from this is they believed and were cleansed, but because he went beyond just believing, but continued into thanksgiving and gratitude, he was not only cleansed, but he was saved. That word's difficult to explain, Sozo. It means he was saved, he was made whole. He wasn't just cleansed, he was made whole. He was made whole in the way that God intended him to be. Isn't that wonderful? How I'd like to be the person that God intended me to be, that whole person that God envisaged I should be. And I know that through thanksgiving and gratitude, I can maybe get there. I'd like to share a few, for a few moments, my own story, because the pastors have asked me to, to do that. They keep being asked by the people how I'm doing. Well, let me tell you how I'm doing, if you don't mind. This is not about me, this sermon is not about me, but I've, I've been asked to share this. Last year, in April, I had a serious pain in my back. Cut a long story short. I um, went to the doctor. I was scanned, examined, <laughs> like the priest. MRI scan, they found there was a mass in my chest cavity. Towards the back, towards my ribs, cut a long story short, it was malignant. And you know, I had to, I had to in that moment, I had to practice what I believed. I will not be afraid of bad news. I can honestly tell you, hand on heart, that when I was told I had a tumor, and that it was malignant. Not for one second did I flinch in fear. I thought, well, whatever it is, it is. You know, I'm gonna trust God and we'll get through this. Anyway, I had a doctor put me on chemo and I went through first line chemo, second line chemo, third line chemo, and that's all you can get in South Africa. And he told me, well, you know, we've exhausted all the chemo that is available to you in this country. There's nothing more we can do for you. We just have to help you to be comfortable and help you manage the pain. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna give you some radiation to shrink the tumor so that you're free of pain. Cut a long story short again. He then came back to him and said that uh, he's been in touch with people overseas and they found a drug in Switzerland that people are responding to. Would I be willing to ask the South African Medical Council for permission to import the drug. I said, oh, definitely, yes, I'll do that. And so we were granted permission and we imported the drug and he submitted the plan to discovery and um, they declined it on the basis of cost. Anyway, we decided we'd pay for it ourselves. And um, I've been through three sessions and the jury's still out, it's on a knife edge, we don't know if it's working or not. I will be having a scan soon. But you know, it doesn't matter because whether I'm healed now or then, I'll be healed anyway. So I'm not afraid of bad news. And I know that death isn't the final word. That the resurrection is the final word. However, that's not the point. The point is that on this journey, I started learning this principle of thanksgiving. Now today happens to be Thursday. We're recording this on a Thursday. And in my prayer time, Thursday is the day I give thanks. Interesting. And so I'd give thanks on a Thursday for all kinds of things. I've got a whole list of things I give thanks for. And I started thinking, well, why do I only give thanks on a Thursday? I don't want to bore you, but I began to practice this principle of thanksgiving. I'd wake up and I'd just thank God. I'd walk through the house, thank God. I'd touch the table, thank God, thank God for my friends. I began to thank God for everything. I just began to say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Jesus. And then all of a sudden, this thanksgiving began to flow over into gratitude. And man, it was incredible, it was wonderful. I'd really developed this life of gratitude and I found that Nothing could upset me. I wouldn't get upset. I wouldn't retaliate. I wouldn't 
I wouldn't have a bad attitude towards other people and things that I saw on the news or whatever the case may be. And my gratitude to God for all the things I've been through uh, and the wonderful things, the wonderful, wonderful holidays, the meals, the, I don't want, I mean, the, you, you all know all the things that I've enjoyed in my life and my children and my family and my wife and my grandchildren, the incredible gratitude that I have for all these things. And that spilled over into joy. Now, let me tell you what happened to me. It was on the day that I went for my first jab. Patricia and I went for our first jab at the Durbanville Clinic. And we got our first jab and we were walking down that road right opposite, right opposite the traffic department. And I stopped Patricia. So holding her hand and I said, hang on, hang on doll. Something strange is happening to me. She looked at me, I said, Tisha, I'm being totally overwhelmed and I'm being overcome by joy. I'm just, I don't know how to explain this. This is totally supernatural. I'm standing in the middle of the road and I'm telling her, there's just this incredible sense of joy. And, and the way to describe it, I'm being baptized in joy. And I don't know why, I, the, the whole world seemed like it was yellow, I don't, I don't, no, like sunshine, the joy of the sun. And I stood in the middle of the road and I gave thanks to God and it was like a baptism because it left, but the residual of that joy has remained. And I'm still full of joy. I'm not just happy, I'm full of joy. I wake up every day happy. I'm full of joy. No matter what happens, I know that I can rejoice in the Lord, irrespective of what happens. Thank you for listening to me. God bless you and goodbye.